Welcome to the Eat Well, Sleep Great, Run Far podcast. My name is Will Franz, and I'm here to help you go farther, faster, and longer without injuries, gut problems, or giving up your favorite foods. This episode was originally recorded as a weekly live in the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition group on Facebook. If you'd like to join these lives, watch past replays, or get any of the written summaries I do for these weekly, please head to the link in the show notes, drop me a comment. I'm happy to help you out. Now, let's get on with the episode. Hey everyone, happy Tuesday. We are live. So thank you all to all of you who posted questions. For one, I was really just not in the mood to make a big like single plan topic this week. In case you didn't see it, yesterday was my birthday and my birthday is not my favorite. For one, I've had like two fairly significant deaths in my life happen in May, um, one of which was my dad on May 19th. And I'm also just really introverted and a bit shy. So I'm not in the best mood. And then a day that's all about me is just not my ideal time. So thank you for all the birthday wishes. Those who did wish them is really appreciated. I had a good day. Um, and thank you for doing the hard work and picking the topics for tonight because it just makes makes life a little easier. And you all get questions you want answered. Double win. So let's start with Brianna's today. Um, no big preamble. We're going to get right on into it because we have a bunch to talk about. So for Brianna, how do you remain hydrated for a race or a long run that has very few aid stations or options to refill bottles or bladders? I'm still waiting to hear on my race this week. There may be one to two aid stations total. For those of you listening, it's a 50K. Um, I'm still waiting for packup, pickup, and course info, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so if you don't have a lot of options to hydrate um, or refill hydration, and yet you're trying to push for performance, we need to figure out a way to carry hydration on you, right? Like that is the short version. This actually reminds me a lot of the setup for the Bigfoot 40. Uh, 40 miles, two aid stations, you're circumnavigating Mount St. Helens up in Washington. It looks beautiful. I really want to do it. I'm way too slow and not good enough of a runner to bushwhack my way around Mount St. Helens for 40 miles with two aid stations. It's just not there, but it does look like a beautiful race. And as a result of looking at it, I've thought about this quite a bit. You have to take a bunch of gear with you and you either need to carry water. If you've ever hiked in the desert or backpacked in the desert, you might know what that's like. It's tedious, but it's a requirement. And if that's not possible, like if there are streams nearby, streams nearby, you could carry a filter. Like that's always an option. Um, but like you might not have one. There's multiple different types. It's something that is probably useful to have if you want to do some of these longer races would be a water filter. You could also get um, purification drops. They are much lighter. They taste bad most of the time, but they do a great job. So you can go to some place like REI and get either a filter or purification drops. And that is one way that you could refill your pack if you have access to something like a stream. Now, there's another option. And I've kind of been wanting to talk about this anyway. I'm first going to caveat it with, I'm not a doctor. Don't do anything with your nutrition or training until you talk with a medical professional. I'm a trainer and a coach, right? So don't be dumb. You can prehydrate. And this is something um, that quite a few people do. This isn't the question, but it has a lot of overlap where, so been talking with some people who have big aggressive sweat rates, right? Most of us will fall in this like one to two liter camp. And if you're on the upper end of that, you still can't technically drink enough water to rehydrate, but you can get close. Your stomach can absorb somewhere between one and one and a half liters per hour. So for most of us, if you're in the like what normal range, you can kind of refill. Some people have a sweat rate of like six liters per hour. And if you're in that realm, there is no way you can actually stay hydrated. So your best bet, if you're in that space, is to prehydrate. And the way you do this is preload 
on sodium and carbohydrate. Some people will go as far as to use glycerol, which is, um, there are food grade versions of it. There are soap making ingredients of that, about it. If you're gonna play with it, be careful, but we can do all sorts of preloading things. The easiest ones are so, uh, sodium and carbohydrates. And you take a little extra for a couple days prior to your race and basically get a little bloated. And that extra water that you're carrying can help keep you hydrated a little longer. Scratch Labs actually makes a product exactly for this purpose. It's about the same as eating a banana and a half a teaspoon of salt. So you can buy the product or not. Um, here, I'll paste it in the comments so it goes along with this. Boom, Scratch Labs. But you absolutely don't need to. You could eat a banana and a half teaspoon of salt with a bunch of water. But long and short, you can increase your sodium or carbs for about a day or two prior to your race, and it should help you stave off hydration a little or dehydration a little longer. You will still likely end up dehydrated if you're moving hard through a bunch of hot weather or you have a really high sweat rate. And for those who have high blood pressure and or kidney issues, you should not do that. I'm not going to like go too much about the effects of sodium on blood pressure. For some people, it's not a big deal. For others, it's life ending. So if you have high blood pressure or kidney issues, talk to your doctor first and don't just blindly use one of these products. But in Fjord and Brianna's case, like that's how I'd handle it. I would add some extra fluid to my pack as much as I can. Like for me, I typically carry two bottle bottles on my chest and a pack or a bladder in the back. I might take my like two spare bottles that I don't use ever anymore, fill them with water and throw them in like the extra compartment of my pack so that they're there. And I would pick up my carbs and sodium about two days prior to the race. And if we can imagine that your race is on a Sunday, because it is, you should increase probably both Friday and Saturday. That's what your carb, carb load should be anyway, a slight increase about 36 to 48 hours out, right? So as you do that, just bump your sodium up a little bit too. And that makes it easy to remember. And it's not going to harm you at all. If you only increase on Friday and not on Saturday, it is going to backfire and you will end up in worse shape than if you started because it will ultimately dehydrate you. So if you're going to do it, commit to it for about two days prior and roll with it. Cool. Um, Fabi, do you have a cure or prevention for shin splints? This is going to be long. Um, this is probably going to be the bulk of this episode. So shin splints have a few causes. I've had them a couple times in my life. Um, only once have I had them significantly. And the first, and that was when I originally moved to Tucson, Arizona, and went from practicing ultimate frisbee on a grass field at my high school to whatever the hell you would call this t soil in Tucson. Clay. It is clay. Didn't know that at the time, just felt like asphalt, especially when you're wearing cleats that don't dig into it. So I got shin splints badly. Eventually, my body adapted to it and I got over it, but it took a few months and I wish I had known a few things that I know now to try to fast track that process because it hurt a lot. Uh, it took me out of a couple practices. I had to go see an athletic trainer during a couple games. And when they tape you for shin splints, they tape your entire lower leg across the shins. And then if you're a hairy person like I am, you have to tear all that off and it sucks. <laughs> and then they'll also dig their fingers in right next to your bone to deal with it. I don't know if that's how they deal with it anymore how they dealt with it then it worked very well it hurt like hell so if we can prevent any of that that would be delightful so shin splints have a few fixes the first one is you could just buy some yeah oscar laughing at me uh-huh 100 percent. it sucked so if we uh we can solve the problem one way by getting some softer shoes, right? And that's not necessarily solving the problem, but if you're just on the borderline, it might fix it for you, right? And I um, have some like Achilles tendon tightness. And so when I run, I actually use like a slight elevation and some softer shoes. Most of the time I wear nothing on my feet. So it is a big switch, but as much as I've tried to go the zero drop and everything, it is fine for me on I'm using on road a lot of the time, but as soon as I start adding like hills and stuff to it, I get wrecked. So shoes can fix your problem if you are like right on the borderline of 
just needing a bit of a like bit of a band-aid okay another thing shin splints often come from a lack of strength in one of many places and you, you could be weak in one or all of these so play with it figure it out i'm happy to talk with you if you want to di design a strength program for yourself so if we strengthen some of these things it'd be great your feet would be one of the first things if your feet are weak um, your bone structure is going to take a lot more which is a lot of what's happening during shin splints we're thudding into the ground and where shin's taking like a bunch of, or shin is taking a beating, right? And that is one thing that we, that's the way we could view it. So if our feet are weak, we're not getting that like recoil from our feet, we're just hitting it into our shins. So we can strengthen our feet. You could start here by just not wearing shoes around your house. As I said, I wear fairly cushy running shoes, not Brooks Ghosts, but um, whatever, the Solomon ones that Ultra Glides. They're fairly cushy. And everything else I wear is really minimal. And it's led to strong feet. And I think that's also helped me a lot. If you want to directly uh, strengthen your feet or hasten the process a little bit, you could do towel drags. Place a towel on a smooth floor, i.e. tile, linoleum, wood, something like that. Place your foot at the close end of the towel and then scrunch your foot together until you've bunched the towel up mimicking here in the video for those listening to it on podcast to make it harder you can put some weight at the other end of the towel and then when you bunch it up you're pulling a little harder it doesn't need to be much a soup can would do the trick at least to start right this is one way that we can directly strengthen our feet you can also do some exercises like uh, piano toes to get control over your toes you can do a thing called short foot which is deeply difficult to explain without a lot of video just look it up on YouTube but the towel drag is a great one it is easy and if you have any smooth surface nearby it works fine okay um, another spot that a lot of athletes are surprisingly weak is their lower abdominals a lot of people have a good access to their upper abdominals but not so much to their lower abdominals that attach like down near pelvis right for these I really like a reverse crunch or a hollow hold. You want something that really forces you to tuck your pelvis. And if you can't even like, so tuck pelvis, I'm gonna demo one sec. Here, tuck, right here, tuck. So if we tuck your pelvis, you're tilting uh, the front up and the back down. So your butt's gonna drop a little bit and your front is gonna lift a little bit. And if we're tucking that, we're gonna engage those lower abdominals. Now, if you can't even find that connection, think, oh, I had this note here, think like twerking, right? If we see someone move that, like that's the tilt that we're looking for. It's up and down, not side to side. Um, so if we wanna find, if we need to find this connection, we can like do these pelvic tilts. Do this by laying on your back with your knees bent and feet touching the floor. That should be fairly easy. If it's not, great, work on that, work on that tilt. Next, extend your legs. That way your legs are no longer helping you get that tilt. And then you would move to standing. And then you can even do that against a wall so you get a little more feedback. And finally, you would do it on all fours so that gravity fights you a little bit as you do that tilt. Once you've reconnected to that motion, you can start to build strength through things like reverse crunches, good hollow holds, a really solid like stability ball crunch. So you do a crunch over a yoga ball and it will help a lot. But first we need to have that connection that is paramount. We can also work our tibialis anterior. Um, that is the muscle on the front of your shin. This is weak, just like your feet being weak, your bones are gonna take a lot more of the brunt of your landing force. And we wanna get that stronger, it'll help anyway right like it helps your uphill drive it helps you have more ankle flexion so you don't hurt your feet as much it, it it's a good muscle to strengthen and you don't use it a lot in running so most of us are pretty weak in it i've noticed big improvements since i've started doing some of these exercises there's one called a tibialis anterior raise and i'm not even going to try to describe this here um, i made a 15 second video that i uploaded to both instagram and TikTok that i will post in the comments and show notes and you should just go watch that and if you want a longer video of it um, i will post a youtube link to uh, ben patrick the knees over toes guy um, 
doing it and explaining why it works and why it matters, right? He's the one I learned it from anyway. So if you want a full description, go here. But we can strengthen the front of that shin and it will help a lot. You can also look at the calves, specifically the soleus. I think a lot of runners are fairly strong in their gastroc that like those two muscles you can really see when you flex your calf, but a deeper muscle called the soleus is often a little weaker. And I've seen a couple runners in my like short time in this sport strain or overwork their soleus. If we can get that stronger, it's going to help anyway. Um, and then it might actually help your shin splints as well. So when your knees are straight and locked out, then you end up working your gastroc. And here's a video I made to work that. Um, but if we're trying to work our soleus, then you actually want to do seated calf raises or bent knee calf raises. And to get the most out of this, you likely want to use a like seated calf raise machine that you could get at a gym, find at a gym. But you can also just do elevated calf raises with your knees bent or you can put something heavy on your knees and do them that way. Sit down, elevate the balls of your feet so that your heels drop all the way, put something heavy on your knees, and do calf raises. This could be weight, it could be a child, make it a game, it could be a dog, anything works, but this will, pardon me, help to build your soleus a bit, right? Finally, a lot of people who have shin splints are weaker in their posterior chain, specifically the glute max and the medial hamstrings. So this will be the like inner part of your posterior chain, of your butt and your hamstrings. If you really struggle when running uphill or you find that you get a really sore butt when running uphill, it is possible that your inner posterior chain is kind of weak, um, at least in proportion to the rest of you, and we might want to strengthen it. So. For this, we can do glute bridges, uh, hamstring curls, Romanian deadlifts, Nordic hamstring curls. If you're really strong, we can all build that, right? And the options are fairly endless. The big thing is we do not want to let the hip externally rotate as we do them. Do not let your foot turn out so or your knees spread wide. So for glute bridges, I will actually put a yoga block between my knees to make sure I stay in that internal chain. I am plenty strong in my external hamstring, lateral hamstrings. Do not need to like build that too much further, at least until I build my medial hamstrings. So we need to keep knees narrow. For Romanian deadlifts, keep your feet narrow, and turn your toes in a little bit. For hip thrust, same thing, narrow stance, keep your knees together. Basic idea, like hit that internal chain. And there are a bunch more exercises that would work here. Uh, the podcast Running Explained, run by Elizabeth, did a great episode on shin splints recently featuring physical therapist Dr. Marie Witt. And one of the favorite thing, one of the things she mentioned that I really liked was a kneeling halo with tops of feet flat. I've actually been doing this for a long time, but I've never really considered it as a treatment for shin splints, but it made perfect sense to me. You sit on your knees, your feet are not tucked behind you. They're actually flat on the ground. This forces you to use your glutes. And then you will do a halo where you hold the weight in front of your face, bring it around the back of your head, and then back up in the front of your face, trying to drop nice and low behind you. Great shoulder mobility exercise. Also, if you're watching the video, you'll see that it would throw you off balance if it's heavy enough, which forces you to engage your core and your glutes. Super useful. Search kneeling halo or tall kneeling halo. And if you keep the tops of your feet flat, that is the exercise we're looking for. I will link an article that Dr. Witt wrote in the episode if you want to dive deeper into shin splint stuff. Uh, it has like three tips there, and all of them are broken down into further subsets. So it's actually like 10 pieces of advice that are super useful. And then I will also link the Running Explained podcast as well. Cool. That's what I have for shin splints. It is largely a strength deficit somewhere. Where exactly that is depends a lot on you. You will eventually adapt, but we can also expedite the process, right? So might as well do that. And I have a bunch of questions from Esther. Um, first, essential core work. So this is going to depend a lot on the person. Technically, the best core work you can probably do is heavy 
big compound lifting. So like heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, these will build a stronger core than anything you can do that specifically targets your core. There's so much weight on you when you're doing a heavy squat that your core, ha your entire midsection, front to back, top to bottom, has to engage and keep you stable so that your spine doesn't collapse. That is incredibly helpful. And we can also do stuff like carries, so farmer's carries where you have a weight out to each side and you walk. Um, suitcase carry will target specifically obliques a little more and your quadratus lumborum, which actually supports your spine. I have an athlete that I'm seeing in person right now where he had a back injury and his QL, his quadratus lumborum, on one side just doesn't work well. Um, it is atrophied immensely. So he'll do a suitcase carry and on one side it works perfectly fine and on the other side like he can barely hold it upright. So anything that forces your torso to stay upright and engaged and stable under a bunch of weight will help you a lot because that's functionally what you're doing when you run. You run and everything like you're just <laughs> pounding uh, constantly and all of that um, pressure is constantly kind of con trying to condense everything. So if we can build you into this big solid cylinder of a torso, that's what we're looking to do. Um, if you want a little more directed stuff, then I would go with what we've talked about earlier for the shin splints, because it tends to be true across the board. Lower abdominals are really helpful here, so reverse crunches are super useful um, because they force that pelvic tilt upwards. And if you don't have access to that, then we should go through some of that as well. And I also really like anti-rotational movements. So a lot of us will know rotational movements like a Russian twist um, or even a cable twist if you have access to a gym. But for running, it's probably more relevant to have anti-rotational movements where you put yourself in a situation that tries to make your hips rotate and then you lock down your obliques so that doesn't happen. And some really good systems for this would be a plank pull through where you get into a good tall plank position on your hands, you have a weight behind, let's say your left hand, and then your right hand pulls it to the right, and then your left hand reaches across and pulls it to the left, and the entire time you're in this beautiful plank where your hips don't rock. It's going to torture your obliques. It's great. And then you can also do a pull-off press, which depending how strong you are, you can use a band, or you might need to put some weight on a cable stack, but you grab weight, and I'm just going to turn and show everybody who's watching what I'm doing here. I'm going to grab a band here. The band is going to be pulling this way. So it's trying to pull me into rotation. I'm going to press out. As I press out, it tries to pull me more into rotation because leverage, and I don't let it. So I'm here, press out, just like this. And I keep in line with my chest, and I don't let myself rotate. That would be a pull-off press. Um, I'm just going to type that in the comments. Pull-off press. And that would be a good way to work anti-rotation as well. If you're looking to build a six pack, it is different. You need to do things like Roman chair setups and reaching setups and use that ab wheel. All these things are great, but they're not necessarily your priority as an athlete. Carries, heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, um, maybe some anti-rotational stuff. Get in touch with your lower abdominals. Those are your big targets. Also have, how do you build mental toughness? Do hard shit is really what I have for you. And sorry to be like super blunt, but that's it. It is, it, you can view it like a muscle. The more you do the hard stuff, the easier it's gonna get. And we can frame this a lot from running, right? Like I'll, I'll use mine. Like I, I'm a newer runner, everybody knows that. I've been coaching people for a while, but I'm a newer runner. Last year, five miles, really long. Today, ran six miles, didn't think about it. And the more we do the hard stuff, the easier it gets. It's functionally exposure therapy. And we just need to do it. I'm not saying you should push so hard that you hurt yourself or there's an issue or you have like an anxiety attack or whatever, someone with mental stuff. Like I try not to like give myself a panic attack in the gym, but occasionally, you just need to do hard stuff, and the hard stuff gets easier to do. It's really it. And there will be some crossover there. So you'll hear a lot of people talking about how ultra running helps them in their life and vice versa. And I think that's probably right. 
Like the more hard stuff you do, the easier and more comfortable it becomes. And a lot of us will keep pushing for harder and harder stuff and not realize the progress we made along the way. So just do hard stuff. Show you all I got. Oh, and find a support structure who will tell you that you're doing hard stuff and that you're great because that helps a lot. So how to sleep better. Um, I did a whole thing on this. Here's a link to my interview with Nick Real about sleep. And I'll post that in the comments or the podcast notes as well. There's also an old video in this group that I can hunt down and link to as well. I'm not going to do it right now, but I will do that after I'm done here. Short version is it depends on why you're sleeping poorly. So there are a lot of reasons why you might be struggling with sleep. And each one of those is going to be really individual. The biggest like blanket across the board, I can say for most people, is get your sleep environment together. Behind the camera that you're watching me on are a set of blackout curtains. So when I close them, this room turns into like apocalypse level dark. And that is super helpful for me. I am really sensitive to light. So if there's any light, um, I can't sleep. It's great when you work night shift, not super fun. So that's the thing I've learned is blackout curtains are an essential part of my life. Um, whereas some people do fine, but cold, your room should be cold. Not freezing for most people, but cold. It should be dark and it should be quiet. And it doesn't need to be silent. In fact, for most people, they're gonna do a little better with some like white noise, but get your sleep environment right and that should help. Also, a good bedtime ritual will help it doesn't have to be anything. It could literally be <laughs> drinking a cup of herbal tea and brushing your teeth, but setting the ritual will help your brain connect to the fact that it is time to go to bed. And some people say TV is bad or whatever, or screens or blue light. There is mixed evidence across the board for all of these things. The biggest thing is don't do stressful shit. The reason that screens, I think, seem to be directly connected with poor sleep is that a lot of the time when we look on screens, we're stro scrolling through Instagram and Facebook and whatever. And these platforms are great if you use them during your day for like social connection and all this stuff. But if you are, they also fire dopamine constantly. That's what they do. The scroll, the hunt, the wanting, like they fire dopamine, which doesn't let you sleep. So get off the apps. If you use it to like read a book, or even watch some TV that was relaxing to you, lovely. Probably don't watch the most recent season of Stranger Things right before you're going to bed. Great show. I was watching it right before I got on here. It's not a like calming thing. I watch like episodes of stuff that I've already seen, right? Because it's boring and helps me go to sleep. So that is the kind of stuff that you will do for sleep. And then sunlight. The biggest thing we can really do is get sunlight into your eyes. So there's a piece of your brain right at the back of your retina called your suprachiasmatic nucleus and it responds directly to bright light. So as soon as you wake up, if possible, get some bright light in your eyes. That could be going outside. That could be getting a blue light box. Right now it gets bright like 530 here. So it's way easier. In the winter, it's a lot harder. But the earlier you can get light in your eyeballs, the faster that's going to set. And again, some people have other stuff going on, but those are the basics when it comes to sleep. Next question was, how many races should you run a year to have optimal performance, and how far apart should these races be? It depends how long your races are, right? Like, you can do more 5Ks than you can 100 milers, right? Different levels of stress in your system. And how far apart should these be? Like, ideally evenly spaced with a bunch of training in between. Like this is one of those hard things where, yes, you can do other stuff um, in your life and we might like think in seasons, but theoretically, if you were going to do a hundred mile, like if you're going to do a hundred miler, probably two, three of those a year, if you want to perform the best, you can do more of them in between, but you'd be running them, not racing them. And then ideally they would be spaced, spaced out fairly evenly through your year. 
and you have a good training cycle in between them. That is how you would maximize that. Same with 5Ks, like they'd be fairly evenly spaced, maybe one a month. I don't know, I'm not a like, not really a 5K coach. Um, it's, it's not my specialty, but you can do this more of this shorter stuff. Uh, you don't need quite as much recovery time, but they are like, they're intense. So you do want a little bit there and you want some spacing in between to like be able to taper, recover, and then redo, right? You can probably perform at the top end of your game a few times a year, depending on who it is, that might be two or five, but it's not gonna be 10. And that doesn't mean you can't race more often. It means don't, you know, try and destroy yourself weekend, like one weekend after another weekend. Go race, go have fun, use it as like a taper temper race, but eventually the stress will add up. And if we look at someone like um, the Iron Cowboy who did 101, I think, Iron Man's in 101 days, he did all of them. If he does one Iron Man, it takes him less than 10 hours. All of those at 101 and 101 days took him like 14 to 16 hours, give or take. At least that's what he said when I saw him live. And when he was done with those, what is that, three and, three and change months of Iron Man's, he actually went into like HPA axis dysfunction and his cortisol was all messed up for months on end. So there's a penalty to like not even, if you're gonna do that much in a row, your performance is gonna drop. And then if you're gonna do that much work together, period, doesn't matter how fit you are, or how recovered you're trying to be, you will end up digging yourself a hole. So you can perform a few times throughout your year. You can race as much as you want, as long as you kind of leverage that in between and take care of yourself. It is always this balance of work to recovery. If you're able to recover, great. But there is some work that you do that is so much that you need some time to recover from. It's really it. And then what are the best practices for taper week? Biggest one is calm down. So the point of a taper is to let everything restore. And there's a really good podcast with a couple of these with um, Inigo Mujica. And he does one with um, Sean Beardson on Science of Ultra and Jason Coop on his Coopcast. And talks about a taper. And for one, the taper should probably be two weeks long. Some people need something longer. Some people get away with something shorter. The average across the board is about two weeks. Like 80th percentile, you need two weeks. We should go from our volume to like 50 to 75 percent of our volume and then to like 25 to 50 percent of our volume that is what our taper should probably look like and then we are going to go um keep some intensity in there not a ton but you don't want to completely drop your speed work i like um some strides here or some like shorter like steady state sessions so not at your threshold but uh, hard and you want to drop your volume by a lot like we just talked about the whole purpose of your taper is to let yourself recover so it's not like you're constantly getting fitter and then you race you are training and training and training and putting all this load on yourself and then you need to let yourself recover so you can adapt from that load the response from training is not immediate it is on a delay and depending on who you are and what your testosterone levels and all sorts of other stuff, how much sleep you get, it is probably on a shorter delay or longer, depending on where you are. But you need to let yourself actually adapt from the training. So the point of a taper is to let that happen, to let like, glycogen restore a little bit, to let your muscles repair, all that stuff. Melissa, I hate the taper. It feels wrong. Lol. Yeah. It sucks, <laughs> especially if um, the, yeah, and by the end of your taper, like here's a good, good sign that you're doing it right. You feel antsy and you want to go, right? Like you should want to go because like the taper is, it should be kind of exhausting. You should be doing all this good work and it should feel great. And then you just kind of lose your mind because you've gotten really stagnant. It feels like you're getting stagnant. You're healing. It's what you're doing, but that kind of sucks. Um, especially for those of us who use a lot of this activity as mental support, that blows. 
So this is one reason I actually recommend you have other outlets. Um, reading, climbing, things that don't affect your legs all that much. Um, go take a walk. You can walk all day. Go take a walk. Hang out with your kids, play with a dog, throw a frisbee around, whatever can help you get obsessed with cooking. I don't care. But like find stuff to do with your taper that keeps you active without really keeping you active. Right? That is a good way to do it. But the main thing is you might see a slight performance improvement by doing a taper correctly. You will absolutely see a performance improvement um, because if you let yourself recover. So you need to recover. It doesn't really matter too much what's in your taper. There's better ways to structure it than others. But if you don't taper, you are very likely to just over leverage yourself directly into the race and then crash in your race. And then finally, from Sarah, I'd love to know <laughs> the dog is a runner too. Yeah, Melissa, it's just, it's fire. I, I hate it personally. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bad taperer. I, I'm not good at it, but I feel you. And you gotta do it. If you care about your performance, you have to do it. So Sarah, um, I'd love to know how to protect your knees while running on a steep downhill. Cool. This is long-ish. Um, we're gonna keep this a little short since we're already at like 36 minutes on this on this broadcast. So the depends where on your knees. I think it's a short like short question I'd ask before we get into it too much. So if it is this like outer part of your knee, which you might call the like lower part of IT band syndrome, that is usually an imbalance between your quads and your hamstrings. Specifically, your hamstrings are probably weak. So let's strengthen your hamstrings if you're experiencing like some level of IT band syndrome. If it is below your knee, uh, it is likely a sign that your quad is a little weaker, specifically your VMO, that um, like diamond teardrop drop shape muscle right above your kneecap on the inner side. That thing might be a little weak, and therefore as your knee comes over your toes, it's not quite strong enough, and you're leveraging that ACL too much, right? Nobody wants that. That's how you tear your ACL. It's not fun. So we need to strengthen that quad. Good movements for that would be like, if you want to use a machine, single leg leg press, uh, narrow squats, heel elevated squats, Bulgarian split squats. I know, everybody's favorite stuff. This is what will build those muscles really well. Single leg squats, pistols, all of this stuff. Build that VMO, and that will help your ACL quite a bit. Um, this is one of the reasons I do a lot of like single-sided unilateral work for my runners is because need to build that inner part of that quad while also working on, next part, stability. So I think my MCL doesn't work right on my right side. It doesn't feel balanced. It hasn't felt balanced for years. I have bursitis on that side. I'm not going to, I can't afford an MRI. So this is what we got. I kind of make my knee or the muscles around my knee stronger. And one of the things I do there is like work on stability and getting my quads and everything else stronger in general has helped that quite a bit. I haven't had knee pain in years unless I try to like work on a split, which I don't care enough to do. So getting your quad stronger with heavy squat work, do not let your knees cave in. If you go knee valgus, like you're exacerbating the problem, right? That's one thing we're doing. And then, um, because you and I have a coaching relationship, something that might be particularly relevant to you, Sarah, is as you go downhill and your knee comes over your toes, you need to be able to push through your whole foot. And if your ankle flexion isn't great, then you can't push through your whole foot, you're just pushing through your toes. So one thing that we can also do is help ankle flexion because that is one of the big things why they told, you for, told people for years to not squat with your knees over your toes because it was bad for your knees. It's not bad for your knees if everything is strong enough to handle the load, but it puts a lot of extra strain on your ACL when your knee is over your toes and you can't support it. So your choices are improve your ankle flexion. You can do things like combat stretches, elevated stretches, elevated calf stretches, all of this stuff. Strengthen your tibialis anterior because it's often not just a lack of uh, Achilles flexibility. It is also often a weakness in the front of that shin. But we also just want to get strong quads. Those two things will work in concert so that as your knee goes over your toes, everything stays stable and balanced and strong, right? 
And last, why is it important to have salt on long runs? Like, what does it do for you? It keeps you hydrated, uh, is the short, flippant answer. Um, if you drink a bunch of water, you are messing up the balance between fluid and sodium in your body. And you can do that for a little bit. Ultimately, if you drink nothing but water and lose a ton of salt through sweat, you will end up hyponatremic, which will kill you. So that's not great. Um, that is the, the big reason why we care so much about sodium. Um, it is not super common, but it's absolutely possible. And a lot of people who do marathons over drink water and don't drink so enough like salt. And this is a big thing. Maybe 10 years ago, we were having cases of hyponatremia. Ultras are so long that if you, even if you didn't intentionally over consume water, if you consume just enough water to hydrate and not enough sodium, you're out there so long that you will still end up hyponatremic. So we need to replace the sodium we're losing. To know how much sodium you're losing is really hard. I tend to give people a blind guess to start of about 500 milligrams per liter of water. It is at the lower end, so you're not pushing salt really high. For most people, it's somewhere between like 400 and 800. Some people are even way higher than that. If you want to test it, there is a product that Gatorade makes called a GX Sweat Patch. I think I'm going to buy some for everybody I train in here in the near future because I'm very curious to see how well they work. And you use this, you exercise with it for about an hour, and it gives you an approximate read of your sodium losses. And it's a it would be a useful thing to know if you're super on the high side, right? So that is a like that is what sodium does. It keeps you safe. The other thing it does is it allows you to drink less water to stay hydrated. So if you lose um, a liter of water, if you were trying to replenish that water through nothing but water, you would have to drink about a liter and a half because there's a lot of loss in the system, right? Like the body is not a perfectly efficient system. So we would need to drink way more. If you add some sodium and carbohydrate to that water, it's much, much closer to a one-to-one. -one. So that's why you can get a sweat test and actually use that as functional data as long as you use sodium and carbohydrate. This is actually probably the primary reason Gatorade worked so well for the Florida football team is they, they're not out there for hours and hours and hours and hours. It's real hot. So they're losing a bunch of fluid, but they were actually able to replenish all their fluid that they were losing because they were using carbohydrates and sodium to get more into their system, right? That's actually the big drive there. So that is what sodium does. Melissa, if we are fueling with water and say tailwind, do we need to worry about sodium? I usually do one 750 milliliter water to one 750 milliliter of tailwind. It depends how strongly you're mixing your tailwind, right? So I don't know what their package directions recommend. I do know that in a scoop, um, which is 100 calories, which is 25 grams of carbs, it has about, I think, 300 milligrams of sodium in it. You're welcome, Sarah. Um, so if you are only doing one scoop in that flask, then yes, you need to worry about sodium. I don't know how much they tell you to mix it with. If there's three scoops in that flask, that's almost a full gram of sodium and you're fine. Right? So like, I'm not sure how much is in that flask, but if you're only using a single scoop, I think that's 300-ish milligrams of sodium, which would be in comparison to about 100 or 1.5 liters of fluid. And yeah, that's probably not enough, is my answer there. Feel free to follow up. Sorry, minus two scoops. Got it. 600. You're in the safety zone there, but you're probably still under a little under. I'd, I'd crank it a little bit um, and see how it goes. You could also get one of those patches and see if it helps. Or 
We can also do another field test, go running outside with a black shirt on and see if it streaks with salt. If it does, you probably lose a little more sodium than the average person. And this can change a couple times throughout your life. Like I've somehow become less sodium, like bleedy <laughs> as I get older. I don't know why, I can't tell you. I used to just end up caked in salt. Now it's slight, so I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it's, I don't eat less of it, so. Hmm? Test it occasionally, but that would be one, one way to look, is either get one of those patches or see if you end up caked in salt at the end. Of course, Esther, you're welcome. Really glad to help. Well, that's 45 minutes, that went long. Really glad you've all found that helpful. Thank you for those who stuck around or for anybody who dropped in at all. If you have any more questions, pop them in the chat. Boom. Polly, what do you recommend using to replace the sodium lost? Salt. Um, sorry, I'm trying to like think of how to help here. I use table salt. Uh, there's some in pretty much every sports beverage or supplement you use. I guess my first question should probably be, what do you currently use in your water? Do you use any electrolytes? Do you use any um, gel packets? Like, what do you use? I'm happy to dial this in real fast. Yeah, no problem, Melissa. I'm happy to help. I, I love doing these. and I'm, I don't have to go to work in a half hour, so I was able to stay a little longer than normal. I'm always happy to do this. Yeah, so before we're on too much dead air, Polly, I, I would use salt. So it, there's about a... Sorry, trying to get my math right. A quarter teaspoon of salt weighs about one gram. There is about 400 milligrams of sodium and about a gram of table salt. So if you use about a quarter teaspoon of table salt for a liter of water, you will be in the like bottom end of that safety zone. Right? That's kind of where my brain would be on that. If you want to go higher, you could. And that actually makes me realize that I did my math wrong earlier. It would be for the um, scratch super hydration, it would actually be closer to a full teaspoon, not a half teaspoon of salt. Anyway, um, Polly, yes, I've been using goo gels and also some electrolyte tablets. Depending which one you're using, you might be fine. So I would look on those and see what your sodium is. Your range, again, is about 400 milligrams to 800 milligrams of sodium per liter of water. Some people need a lot more. Some people need literally double that upper end. So they need a full like gram and a half of sodium. That is way too much for most people. Some people are there, right? This is the thing that we can like test a little bit. You can get a sweat test at a lab or you can get one of those patches I have no affiliation with and never tried but plan too soon. But the biggest thing, if you're using goo gels, they do a really good job of finding that ratio as do certain electrolyte tablets. Also, don't go overboard. If you are, if salt tastes bad, you're done. Um, your tongue does a really good job of talking to your kidneys and your filter system for your salt. So if salt still tastes good, you're okay. If salt tastes bad, you don't need more salt. That's actually a really helpful thing to know for most people. Um, a lot of the other signs can get kind of mixed and wires can get crossed. For example, one sign that you're probably low on salt is that your fingers swell, unless you also end up with um, swelling no matter what you do. My ring is impossible to get off when I run. It doesn't matter if my salt's on point or not. My salt is not on point, it's worse, but I can't get my ring off after I run. It doesn't matter how good I've been with my nutrition, like how dialed in I get it. So. The swelling, um, urine stuff, whatever, is really hard to dial in for sodium. Does salt taste good? If yes, then go for it. If no, don't. And again, if you have kidney issues or high blood pressure, talk to a doctor. Probably talk to a doctor anyway, because that's what you should do. But that is a really good sign. How does salt taste? Cool. We're boarding up on 50 minutes. I think I'm gonna be it. If anybody doesn't have any comments or questions in the next like 30 seconds, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, every week is just delightful to help you out and I really am glad that I'm able to provide you with some info. There will be a replay of this up on the podcast and keep an eye out for the next couple weeks. Some big stuff is gonna be dropping in this group. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. 
and you have a good rest of your night. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you for listening to the show. To be clear, I'm not a doctor nor a registered dietitian, and nothing you heard was medical advice. You should always speak with a qualified medical professional before making any changes to your training regimen. If you enjoy the podcast or found it useful, please take a couple seconds to give it a rating or share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. And if you want more of this information, please head to the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition Group on Facebook. You'll be in good company with other like-minded people who like to do hard stuff outside.